All right. <coughs> hmm. I see a picture of somebody. I don't think it's me. Ah, somebody's here. Okay, good. Alan Jim, good. All right. I bring up the schedule. We're live. Yeah, here. There. November 3rd, up for the second part of security engineering. All right. Good. Got three people. I think I'll wait a few more minutes. Maybe till five after. Because I expect KT. Again, Sam? Looks like I've got enough bandwidth. I'm uh, broadcasting from the Rochester, New York, where my students are here at a pen testing contest. And when I have to wait a few minutes, I usually like to talk about the news. I see what there's interesting news worth mentioning. There usually is. That's kind of cute. Do you guys know what the most popular digital payment is? Because I didn't. According to this article, it's Apple Pay, which I've never used. I've had Apple devices and hadn't used it, but of course I never used PayPal either, so maybe. That one looks interesting. And this one was cute. Let's see if we got any more. No, no more people right away. Um, Okay, there's two more I'll mention, and then I think we'll get going. Um, so this is an interesting question. If iPhone has a picture of your face for Face ID, does that stay on your phone or not? And at first they said it would never leave the device, but now they're saying app developers can have access to that data, which can be removed from the phone and stored on developers' own servers. So it looks like Apple has some to do here, and we'll... We'll find out how true that claim is. <coughs> I know app, I haven't heard this so much from Apple, but I know Facebook is very much guilty of this, uh, where they keep on promising you privacy and then they sell your data to people who want it to make money. This was pretty cute. So this guy is trying to test, he's got malware and he is being detected by all these engines, but to fix it, all he has to do is go in, as you know, every Windows program starts with this MZ, Every window is executable, and then it has this program cannot be run in DOS mode. So we just changed the word this to that, and that fooled like 11 out of 50 antiviruses. So yeah, I've done a bit of this. If you start modifying code to get past antivirus engines, it reveals how very, very weak they are. They are very disturbingly stupid in how they identify things, and often the smallest change will slip things past them. Anyway. I think we can get started here. So, up to the second part of chapter four. Let me move a little more stuff from my screen. And I guess I ought to hit this mute all so people don't annoy one another. All right. So, uh, we're going to talk about cryptography. 
uh, the history and the current forms of cryptography, and then a bit of physical security, perimeter defenses and doors and environmental controls and such. So in cryptography, <coughs> the point here is to make a cryptography a secret writing where you send a message over an insecure channel, and even though attackers can see the scrambled message, they cannot unscramble it. That's the goal. Cryptology is the science of uh, studying this with mathematics, and cryptanalysis in particular is breaking into these encrypted methods. Uh, Cypher is the algorithm you use to scramble the text. Plain text is the readable message that you want to send and deliver. And ciphertext is the scrambled stuff which you send over an insecure channel, hopefully being able to trust your routine to protect it from your adversaries. <clears throat> the main thing you get from cryptography is confidentiality. <coughs> so the uh, unauthorized people cannot read the secrets. You usually also get integrity because for most cryptographic routines, if someone modifies the ciphertext, it becomes unreadable. And uh, the fact that it's readable strongly implies that it has arrived in an unaltered state. But not all cryptographic uh, methods have that property. There are ones where you can modify the ciphertext to create different readable text without the key. Authentication is a desirable property also in communication where you know that the person talking to you is actually the person you want to be hearing the message from. And cryptography does not necessarily provide that, but it can through digital signatures. And non-repudiation is another even stronger problem, which is if someone makes a promise like a loan, this is necessary for uh, financial transactions over the internet, there has to be some kind of signature so that you can promise something and you cannot later deny that you did it. So there has to be a cryptographic signature that cannot be forged by anyone else. Confusion and diffusion are desirable properties of a um, crypto system. Confusion means there's no relationship between the plain text and the cipher text. And diffusion means that the influence of the key should be dispersed throughout the cipher text. Uh, all right, so there are uh, only about three or four primitive methods used to accomplish cryptography, and two of the main methods are substitution and permutation. Substitution is where you replace one character with another, and permutation is where you rearrange the letters in a method. Each one of these by itself is not a strong cipher, but combined with other methods, these are often part of major crypto systems. The cryptographic strength that is defined as how difficult it is for someone without the key to read the message, reading only the plain text. Unfortunately, this is a mathematical concept, and even if you prove that a system is cryptographically strong in this fashion, <coughs> pardon me, it's often not that strong in practice because there is some other way to get the key, and mathematics does not protect you from that. And that's the problem, how real implementations often have weaknesses, even if they use mathematically strong systems. <coughs> All right. Another common technique is to try to conceal from people what cryptographic system you're using, and this has a very bad reputation in the industry. Generally, it is much better to use syst people systems that are open, where they tell you what you're using, and you know it's a good cipher, rather than people that try to keep secret what they're using, because almost always, it turns out that the thing they're keeping secret is something foolish and unsafe. <coughs> All right. Monoalphabetic ciphers are the simplest ones, like you'll see in the Sunday newspaper, where one plain text letter changes to one cipher text letter. It's usually easily broken with frequency analysis. Uh, for cartoons you see in the Sunday newspaper, all you have to do is look for short words, like one or two letters, and then just try guessing common short words, and pretty soon you'll figure it out. For longer messages, you can just count the frequency of the letters, and the most common letter is E, and then T, and then A, and you can pretty quickly break it that way. Polyalphabetic ciphers try to resist those tricks by using multiple substitutions. So there's a, several alphabets and each word is transposed with a different alphabet. Each letter is, is substituted differently so that the frequency analysis still has some virtue, but it's much less effective. <clears throat> the all cryptographic systems use modular arithmetic because you have a limited range of possibilities of the plain text and of the ciphertext. So you have a ring of possibilities and you just like a clock face, 
uh, the numbers can never leave the ring. So as you know, as a clock, 12 plus one just gets you back to one because you wrap around 12. All right. That's m and then there's exclusive or, by the way, I should mention the mathematical version of modular arithmetic usually starts at zero. So m mathematical mod 12 is really going from zero to 11. And 12 mod 12 is zero. Uh, you get the, to calculate something with a modulus, you divide it by the modulus and keep only the remainder. Any integral number of complete circles around the ring is discarded. The exclusive OR is another fundamental um, mechanism used in cryptography because it preserves information. And an OR destroy information because they have a three quarters probability of giving you the same bit. So if you feed in data that's half ones and half zeros, you get out data that's three quarters one and only one quarter zero or the opposite. And there's not as much information there, so it cannot be reversed. But exclusive OR can be reversed. It does not destroy information because if you feed in half ones and half zeros, you get out half ones and half zeros. All right. It XOR also reverses itself. So if you take attack at dawn and XOR it with apple, 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 it turns into this junk here with dollars, dollars, and ampersand and such. And if you take that junk and XOR it again with the same key, it goes back to its original state. There are quite a few crypto systems that undo themselves. So another common mistake in cryptography is to take a weak system and then try doing it twice or three times to make it stronger. And sometimes you don't make it stronger at all by using it two or three times. You have to encrypt data at rest if you are afraid that someone is going to steal your storage medium, like a laptop. And you have to encrypt data in motion if you are not transmitting over a secure channel and you are afraid that someone else will see it. Uh, VPNs provide virtual private networks by encrypting data that goes over a public network with a secret known at each end. So the end result is as if you had a trusted private line. Nobody except the people at each end can read it. All right, so you choose your best method. You have to decide how fast the cryptographic system is, how strong it is, how much it costs, and how complex it is to maintain. This turns out to be quite complicated. Um, PGP or the free product GPG use public key encryption, but it turns out that handling the key is so difficult that even the people that invented the system have pretty much abandoned using it because it is too difficult to uh, publish the public key and make sure that you have the matching private key available when people send you messages. So uh, just the difficulty of implementing it outweighs the, it is more of a problem and it's better for most people to use less cryptographically strong methods that are easier to use. All right, so I've got some cahoots about that, and I've also got some cahoots that weren't ready last time. So I think I'll start with tonight's and then do a couple of review ones from last time. They are here, my cahoots. Okay, here's the new one. And it should be, yeah, those are the correct options. All right. <coughs> there we go. Uh, five digit number to join up. Good. I've only got four people that could join, and Nua might join anyway. Uh, wait a few seconds and see. Aha, uh -huh. all right. I bet that's as many as are coming then. So let's do it. Five questions. All right, Jeff is at a meeting, and there's a photo, so he can't deny it. What does that photo provide? All right, that's non-repudiation. You can't deny what you did. Caesar moves each letter three steps in the alphabet. What's that? That is substitution. 
It's not permutation. Permutation is where you take the existing letters and rearrange them. Substitution is where you replace each letter with another letter, like one that's in a different spot in the alphabet. All right, what systems resist frequency analysis? All right, polyalphabetic substitution is the one that resists frequency analysis because there are many different alphabets which change each letter differently, so they confuse the, uh, the uh, pattern of frequencies. <clears throat> All right, what's 17 mod 5? Right, it's two, good, all the answers that came are correct. You divide it by five and take the remainder, so you throw away 15 and you have two left over. All right, what's three XOR four? All right, I'm not, no right answers on that one, so let me just talk about it a bit. All right, the way XOR works is if the bits, let's see, so three is zero, one, one. You have no fours, and the first digit tells you you have no fours, the next bit tells you you have a two, and the next bit tells you you have a one. So that's three. Four is one, zero, zero. You have a four, no twos, and a one. Now an XOR, let me just put it here. All right. I'm going to go up here and move these over. All right. All right. So to XOR them, what you do is if the bits are different, the answer is one. If the bits are the same, the answer is zero. So when you XOR it, you get one, 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 which is seven. Okay? Just mention one. XOR1 is 0, and that's also 0, XOR0. Zero. 1, XOR0 zero is 1, and that's also, of course, 0, XOR1. That's how it works. If the bits are different, the answer is 1. If the bits are the same, the answer is 0. That's exclusive OR. Okay. Let me know if you have any questions. All right. Let's carry on here. So, did we get to the end of those? Wait a minute now. I don't think, there might be one more. Nope, just want to see who won. All right, so Al's the winner. All right. So in the history of cryptography, there have been various systems used, and these were strong at the right time, long ago, and most of them are no longer considered strong, of course. That's one nasty thing about cryptography. Whatever you do in at a later time, it's probably no longer strong. So Spartans used uh, a sky taily. I don't know how they pronounce it. They would write their message and then wrap it around a stick and read it horizontally. So this was just permutation. They would not change any letters. They would just put them in a different order. And that was enough at one time for military secrets. Caesar did substitution where he just moved everything uh, two or three steps forward in the alphabet which again was considered military uh, secrets, strong enough for military secrets long ago. Microsoft still uses this system, ROT13, to protect your privacy when you save Internet Explorer favorites, and I imagine Edge favorites too, the rec registry keys flip the letters around with this system by just rotating them 13 steps in the alphabet. It's a very weak system. The Vigneri Square was a polyalphabetic substitution cipher where you have um, two things go in. The plain text might be T, and the key will be some word. And if it has an E, you use alphabet E to shift it. 
And if it has some other letter, use a different alphabet to shift it. So it uses multiple alphabets, and that will help resist a sub, uh, frequency analysis. Here's the uh, Cypher Disk of the National Cryptologic Museum, used to essentially automate the Caesar cipher and let people begin to understand encryption. And this was used in the Civil War by the Confederates. They made these metal versions, so all you'd have to do is rotate the disk through a certain number of steps, and you could decipher orders. <coughs> book cipher is another one. The shared secret is a book. You have to have the same book at both ends, and then you just put down page numbers, paragraph numbers, and word numbers, and people look up the words one by one in the book at the other end. So it's a secret key system, and the secret is that book. And if an attacker can somehow figure out what book you're using, they can get in the system. A running key cipher is common for things like the polyalphabetic system we saw, where there has to be a key. You want to encrypt a message. Let me just make this a little smaller so I can point around. You want to encrypt a message, attack at dawn. So you take something like we the people as your key, and you keep repeating that phrase as many times as necessary. I guess they're going to use a longer thing here, like maybe the whole Gettysburg Address, but that tells you uh, which alphabet to use. It's a way to implement a polyalphabetic cipher. And uh, there are code books that would just replace words with other words arbitrarily. So the U.S. Secret Service uses these. Hillary Clinton is evergreen. Barack Obama is renegade. They have secret code names for people. And if you don't know the code book, you don't know who they're talking about. Uh, the one-time pad is an old system that is completely unbreakable. It was considered perfect at the time, and no one has ever found any way to break it. It's very simple to understand. You have a page full of random letters, and you use those letters to shift each letter of the message. And the thing that makes it unbreakable is the random letters have to be truly random, created by something like rolling dice, and you never reuse any part of the key again. You use a page to encrypt one page of plain text, and use the next page for the next page of plain text. So there is no mathematical pattern in the output at all. And there's no way for anybody to break it by analyzing the ciphertext. Indeed, if you try a brute force attack against a one-time pad, you generate all possible combinations of letters. So you will see every possible message, and you have no idea which message was intended. The only problem is, if you want to send one megabyte of data, you have to previously send one megabyte of pad through a trusted channel, and you cannot reuse it. So the secret that you send before has to be longer than the total amount of data you're going to send, and that creates a very unwieldy key distribution problem, and that has meant that very few people actually use this system. Uh, the setup is too difficult, but if you do, it's very strong. The KGB used so-called one-time pads, but they were broken into because they didn't use the pads only one time. And if you reuse the pad more than once, then there is some kind of pattern in the output that could be used to break it. <coughs> Hebron machines, like Enigma, used by the Nazis, are mechanical typewriters that have extra gears rolling in there, so it calculates the key to type based on the key you, you type in, and these things can be quite strong if the patterns of gears are strong enough, implementing something like a polyalphabetic substitution cipher. Um, there have been laws restricting export of cryptographic systems. Until 1994, the United States was, it was made it illegal to export cryptography, and this meant there was trouble sending Windows operating systems out of the country. And there were cryptographically weak ciphers developed just for export, which are still in use on the internet today and create a security problem. But the Wassenaar arrangement in 1996 helped to relax this. And we currently, I don't believe there's any legal restriction on exporting strong cryptography. It's kind of senseless anyway, because our enemies like Russia and China and North Korea have good mathematicians and they are really not using weak encryption, waiting to steal our strong encryption. It's more the opposite. They're inventing plenty strong encryption out there. Anyway, so here's the three fundamental cryptographic procedures that are used for computer security and the internet. Now, mathematics is a huge field, and people invent tons of things, <coughs> but we are engineers here, and the only ones we care about are the ones that have a practical utility, 
And these are the three systems that we're using. Symmetric encryption is the ancient kind of encryption that goes all the way back to Caesar, where you have one key and you have to somehow give the sender and the receiver the same key. And once you've done that, you can send messages, but the messages can be opened by anybody that has the key. And if somebody is able to steal another copy of the key, they can read your message. Asymmetric encryption was a military secret until the uh, 70s when it was reinvented by public mathematicians. And this lets you send secrets over an insecure channel without ever exchanging a secret key, like magic. It's very powerful, but it's much more expensive. It takes uh, much more computer time to do than symmetric encryption. And hashing is not a way to send a secret message at all. Hashing is a way to put a fingerprint on a file so you can tell if that file has been altered. So this provides integrity, not confidentiality. So symmetric encryption is called secret key encryption. The fundamental weakness of this system is the key distribution. You have this oxymoron called a shared secret. You have to have a secret key and you have to share it with somebody else. And the whole system relies upon neither of you making an additional copy of the key or losing it. And neither one of you can be sure that hasn't happened because the other person might have leaked the key. So that's an intrinsic weakness in the system. But aside from that weakness, it can be quite strong. Uh, stream ciphers encrypt one bit at a time. The most common example is WEP, wireless encryption, that uses the RG4 stream cipher. The more common type is block ciphers, where you have a block of data, either 64 or 128 bits are the common block sizes, and you encrypt one block and then the next block and then the next block. Block, all right, yeah. um, block ciphers have a problem. Stream ciphers might possibly have this problem too, but block ciphers have it certainly. Suppose there are two inputs of data that are exactly the same, 64 bits of zero, for example. Later on, there's another 64 bits of zero. Simple block ciphers will create exactly the same output, so you will have some patterns in the input that are preserved in the output, and that's not good. So an initialization value is a random value added to plain text before encryption, so that if two identical plain text blocks occur, they don't have identical ciphertext. And cipher block chaining is a common technique where you take the output of encrypting one block and you use that as the initialization vector for the next block. This means that uh, you will get apparently random output even if the input has blocks that are identical. The data encryption standard was recommended and to some extent forced by the, U uh, by the US government decades ago. It was a originally 128-bit cipher, which would still be unbreakable from IBM, but the National Institute of Standards, under pressure from the National Security Administration, weakened it to a 56-bit key, which apparently the NSA could crack at that time, but for a couple of decades, nobody outside the NSA had a powerful enough computer to do that. And this is a problem with the American government. The NSA's mission is to make sure they can read everything, so they really don't want us using secure ciphers. They want something they call no bus, nobody but us. They want a secret backdoor so they can read everything, but they don't want anyone else to have it. And that is hard to do, but they've tried several times to do that, and this was the version of it in the 70s and 80s, was DES, where the key was the length that only the NSA, as far as they could tell, had a machine powerful enough to crack it. Of course, they have not admitted that, and that is not considered a historical fact. It is a deduction made from the outside that everybody in the cryptography community pretty much believes, but nobody can really prove. Anyway, it, DES did use a 56-bit key, which is too short, and was cracked by brute force in the 90s and is no longer trusted. But DES uh, set the standards for uh, government-approved encryption, and it did address this issue of patterns being preserved in the ciphertext. So they defined these five modes of how to handle encrypting block after block of data for any block cipher. The electronic codebook is the simplest and weakness, weakest system, and all these others are stronger. Cipher block chaining, cipher feedback, output feedback, and counter mode. The electronic codebook is the simplest, <coughs> where you just encrypt each block with the key, and that's it. And if you get another block of input that's the same, you'll get the same output. You don't worry about anything else. Uh, this is where you the only secret is the key, and the only input is the key. So if you take an image 
a bitmap that has blocks of solid color and encrypt it. The encrypted version is shown here on the bottom. The blocks of solid color just encrypt to blocks of repeated data at the other end. So you could say this is not very encrypted at all. It hasn't removed the shape of the apple from the image. All it did was change the colors. So that's what's wrong with electronic codebook mode. It doesn't really scramble all the data very well. So what's far more common is CBC mode, cipher block chaining. Now, using the output of each block to encrypt the next block creates, as you can see on the bottom here, just random pixels. That's what most people think encryption should be. There is no information left in the encrypted text at all. You look at that and you have no idea what message is being sent, and that's what you expect from encryption. And all these other modes have that general effect because all these modes take some data from one block for the next block, except counter mode that just takes a series of predictable numbers to add to each one, but it still has the effect that a different number is added to each block. So uh, repeated blocks of input do not lead to repeated blocks of output. Single DES was the original data encryption standard approved by the government. In the late 90s, it was proven that it was unsafe. So there was a need for a replacement system. Now, in the long run, there was a competition, and the real replacement was AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, but AES was not backward compatible with DES, so there was a need for a temporary encryption routine to be available as you upgraded from old DES-based equipment to newer equipment, and that was triple DES, was the temporary stopgap measure used to be stronger than DES, but easily reduced to DES to interoperate with older systems. So triple DES uses three rounds of DES encryption. Uh, the most secure method would use three different keys, but the most common method uses two different keys, um, which is still considered strong and unbreakable by modern standards. But it is slower to compute than AES. It's not that it's insecure that caused people to abandon it, but it's just not the most efficient use of your processor, AES is. IDEA is one of the runners up to be given the award of being called the uh, advanced encryption standard. So it's quite secure and perfectly fine. It was just not the one chosen to be approved by the US government. And um, it's patented in some countries. It's considered secure, but, but it's also not very popular because it's slower than AES. And AES is by far the most common encryption routine these days. Uh, as far as anyone knows, this is completely unbreakable, uh, very strong, very fast on computers as the standard for all kinds of products. There's the weakest, the shortest key is 128 bits. There's 192 and 256 bits. The most common technique is the 128 bit system, which is considered strong enough for most purposes. AES 256 is recommended for top secret military information, just to make it more resistant to potential attacks that may be developed in the future. Uh, so here are the finalists which were um, contending for the, given the award of being approved by the government as AES. <coughs> and in practice, they are all probably perfectly fine. Just one of them was considered the best of the lot, but none of them have any known weaknesses as long as you choose a key length of 100 bits or 128 bits or longer, these should all be fine. Uh, there's a nice movie online. I don't think I'll play it tonight, but I could just point to some of the things here. This is what happens in AES. You First, you add a round. You have a, a key here, which is 128 bits, so it's 4 by 4, 16 bytes. You feed in a state, which is calculated from the plain text. Then you add a round key. You substitute bytes, shift rows, mix columns, and add another round key, and you do that whole thing nine times. And the 10th time, you do only three of those operations. So this is what I meant earlier when I said that things like substitution and XOR are not enough in themselves to make a strong cipher. But if you just take similar operations and mix them together and have many rounds of it, they can produce a very strong cipher. And that's all AES is. And AES was designed not just to be difficult to crack. It was designed to be fast to run on modern processors. And it accomplished those goals very well and is now the standard for most systems. Blowfish and Chewfish are other alternatives, unpatented and freely available. And there are various key sizes available. If you choose a uh, long enough key size, these are also considered quite fine, but they're just not very popular because AES works fine and there's no particular reason to use anything else. RC5 and RC6 
uh, also come from RSA, and they're considered uh, reasonably strong too, as long as your keys are long enough. There's, and then we should talk about asymmetric encryption. This is the miracle that lets you send a secret over an untrusted channel without previously preparing it by sending a shared secret. This is based on Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So each user has to make two keys. The problem with this system is you have to be the person who creates the keys does not gain the ability to send anything. All you get is the ability to receive things. The person at the other end that you wish to send data to must prepare themselves by making a key pair. And unfortunately, most software applications make it difficult to generate that key pair. So only a relatively skilled technical person can do it. So it is difficult to use this system to send a message to an unskilled person at the other end. But there are a few cases where it's done easily and automatically in your browser, like uh, SSL, that everybody can use. So each person has to make a key pair, a private key you never tell anybody, and a public key which you publish where anyone can see it. And now anyone that wants to send you a secret can encrypt it with the public key and send it over an insecure medium, and nobody can read it except the holder of the private key. And unlike private key encryption where you have this oxymoron called a shared secret, here you have a secret, but you never share it with anybody, and that is a much more secure, much more scalable system. Uh, you, you can have a high degree of confidence that there are no extra copies of that key because you control it. In order for this to work, you have to have a one-way function, which is unfortunately an approximate sort of vague concept. It's not anything mathematically perfect. You have to have a function that is easy to run one way and hard to run backwards. That's because the public key and private key have to be related, and you relate them in a way that it's easy for the person generating the key to take the private key and calculate the public key, but other people who know only the public key cannot easily deduce the private key. Unfortunately, there is no way to mathematically prove that something is difficult. All you can prove is that the current techniques are very slow, but you can never be sure that there isn't a faster technique waiting to be discovered and if that happened, then your one-way function is no longer one-way and your public key encryption is no longer safe because the people that can easily see the public key could find the private key. So the most common one-way function that's used is factoring a number into its component primes. This has been studied for thousands of years by number theorists and nobody has found any fast way to do it. So if you have, that's what RSA uses. The public key is the product of two large prime numbers and there is no known way to factor that public key and find the private key, which consists of the prime numbers it's made of, in any reasonable amount of time. Discrete logarithm is another system using the same uh, one-way function uh, called LGMAL. And elliptic curve cryptography is a different system that uses a, a property of elliptic curves, and the, it amounts to the same thing. There's an elliptic curve one-way function. Uh, it is much faster like 20 or more times faster to compute. The keys are much smaller and the math is much faster. So this is becoming popular, especially on things like cell phones and tablets, where you really want to preserve battery life and your processors are not very strong. So the getting the same level of security with for faster computation is very desirable. So the asymmetric and symmetric encryption are the two types of encryption used. Symmetric algorithms use shorter keys. Anything above about 100 bits is fine, and they're very fast. RSA, you have to use um, asymmetric encryption, which is much, much slower, perhaps a 1,000 times slower. And so what's typically done is instead of sending all your data with public key encryption, all you do is encrypt a private key and send it, and after that use AES. That's what RSA actually does in practice, just to make it much faster. And so here you have a nice table of recommended key lengths. You can see that for symmetric cryptography on the left, 112 bits is what you get with triple DS, and 128 with AES, and those are considered unbreakable and perfectly fine. And if you wanted to have comparable security with um, RSA or this discrete logarithm, you'd have to have 2,000 or 3,000 bits of key, which is why it's so much slower. The key is 20 or 30 times larger for the same security. And for elliptic curves, you see a key as short as 224 bits or 256 bits is enough. So it's almost as small as a 
uh, private key encryption technique. So the appeal of it from a standpoint of efficiency is quite clear. All right, so those are encryption routines to scramble data. Another issue which comes up in, on the internet is that you have to somehow assure integrity of data. You sent data to the other end and you want to have a test there to see if it really got there correctly. So for that, you need a hash function. The first hash function was the um, parity bit. You would send seven bits of data and the eighth bit would just tell you if the total number of bits was even or odd. So if a single bit was flipped, you could detect it. That was the simplest way to have some kind of signature attached to a message. And then we moved to CRC32 like Ethernet used. And then MD5 was invented in the 90s. And then other ones called SHA. MD5 is 128 bits long and it was never considered very secure. Um, there are now, you can write programs that will calculate two files with the same MD5 hash. So if you do send something, to a recipient and they hide the same MD5 that does not prove with complete certainty that it wasn't altered. It still probably was unaltered, but if you want complete security, you should use a SHA function. Um, and <coughs> the SHA-1 is no longer trusted because Google found a SHA collision earlier this year. They managed to find two files which, in, which combine, condense to the same SHA-1 value. So now it is recommended that we use SHA-2, which is longer, and SHA-3, is so recent that it's probably not gonna be on the CISSP exam, and I don't think anyone is actually using it for any public purpose. The only point of it is it's available in case somebody breaks into SHA-2. Uh, most people do not expect that to happen anytime soon. They think we'll be perfectly fine using SHA-2 for decades. Uh, there's another system called HAVAL, a hash of variable length, uh, which I haven't heard of anyone actually using, but it's available. Uh, the quality of a hash function, the most important consideration is usually collisions. Can you actually find two files that hash to the same value? In principle, there always are files that hash to the same value because if the files are longer than the hash function, as they usually are, there are more total possible files than there are total hash values, but a proper hash function is designed so that it is not possible to find those files because their collisions are so rare that it would take more time than all the processing time available to anyone to find them. And so SHA-1 collisions were found in the year 2017, and people are now moving to SHA-2. MD5 has had known collisions for more than 10 years and is not considered very cryptographically secure at all anymore. All right, I got some cahoots here. And I want to remember to do the cahoots from last time. I meant to do them last time and got distracted. Maybe I can remember them this time. So here are, I see I have a lot more people have appeared. So let me start these and let's see how many people are cahooters. Yeah, all right, we're here. All right, so there's your seven digit number to join the cahoot. <laughs> All right, we might have as many as seven if everyone joins. Yeah, there's five. We're getting there. I'll wait a few more seconds. Ah, I see KT is back. Good. I'll wait five more seconds. All right. Six questions. What is the strongest system among these choices? Right, the one-time pad is, as far as anyone knows, completely unbreakable, even with modern equipment. All the rest of these are easy to break if you have a long message in modern computers. Unless you do something foolish with a one-time pad, like not really create the numbers randomly or reuse them, there is no known way to break it. All right, which one of these processes uses no key?
All right, that's hashing. Hashing is not a way to send a secret. It's just a way to put a fingerprint on something so you know if it has been altered. There is no way to reverse a hash in principle because in principle, many files do have the same hash value. All right. Which cipher encrypts bits one at a time? All right, that's a stream cipher. All the rest of these are block ciphers that have a have to group data into blocks of 64 or 128 bits to encrypt them. Stream ciphers just encrypt them one bit at a time. Which mode preserves patterns in the input? All right, that's it, electronic code book. You saw the picture of an apple in crypts, but you can still see the apple, so it's not that good. All right, what's the weakest scheme on this list? All right, and that's DES. DES is the one that is no longer safe to use. All the rest of these are perfectly fine for modern use. Uh, the one might be AES is more efficient than the others, but they're all considered perfectly fine. But DES is unsafe. If you use DES, people can get in by trying every possible key. All right, which system is popular on mobile devices? All right, and that's elliptic curve systems. They save time and power. All right, so carbon is the winner of this one. I'm going to do a couple from last week, just as a review, before I forget about them. There were a couple of these I was not ready for last semester, or last time. 4B. Yeah, 4A, here we are. I think it was the last two. 4 and 5 were not ready, so let's try them. Here's 4 from last time. All right. All right, we got five people. I'll wait another five seconds to see if any more are coming. Aha, okay, good. Let me wait another five seconds then. All right, looks like this is how many people we're going to get. Let's give it a shot. Four questions. So what do you need for TC SEC level A? <clears throat> That's it. You need a reference monitor. Not too popular, but the TC SEC level A is the American old DOD standard. A is the highest level. And to get it, you must have a reference monitor, which is software that keeps track of who people are and makes sure that they can only access the information that they are cleared for. What's the security risk of virtual machines? That's it, VM escape, when an infection on a virtual machine escapes and infects the host. All right, what kind of service is Canvas? <laughs> All right, that's software as a service, like Gmail and Kahoot, 
you're just using a program somebody else wrote. You can't change the code. You can't change the operating system. All you can do is use the options they provide you. All right, what system combines dissimilar computers together to get more CPU power? All right, that's grid computing. Good. All right. So high thing on that one. And there's one more of these old ones to do. And then we'll take a little break before we pick up with the new stuff. So it's 4A number five right here. All right, there's your number. All right. There's six. I'm waiting five more seconds to see if anyone else wants to join in. All right. Six it is. Five questions. <clears throat> All right. What does the FBI want on iPhones? They want a back door, of course. They're trying to call it something else politically, but they want some way for them to get the data. All right. What threat destroys a system on a certain date? All right. That's a logic bomb. Waits for some condition, and then the payload executes. Which language tends to have LFI vulnerabilities? That's PHP, local file inclusion, and remote file inclusion are the common vulnerability because PHP very often refers to a file name with a parameter, and the developer does not think about an attacker putting malicious data in that file name and pointing to some unexpected file that should not be available to them. All right, what organization puts the top 10 list of web vulnerabilities? All right, that's a WASP, of course, good. The Open Web Application Security Project. All right, and what attack search is a large database for useful information? All right, that's data mining, good. All right, so high fang wins again. All right, it's 9.52, let's take a break for eight minutes and pick up right at 10, then we'll finish up that chapter. So I'll stop the share and start another one about two minutes before 10.